Hi, this is Pinchas. Uh, what you're watching is a recording of a multi-part seminar that I did live with audience participation. So if you hear people talk to me back and forth, this is exactly what it is. And this is not the first segment. Uh, by the way, if you want to watch this seminar, I suggest you start watching in the beginning. If you're continuing with me, then thanks. I guess you really want to see how far I can take this. And now in this particular segment, what I do is I continue to read uh, John 11 verse by verse and I explore what were Jewish funerals really like in the first century? Uh, what did people think about resurrection in that time? Uh, why did the Jews come and stayed around for so long at this funeral? And what exactly caused Jesus to weep? So we continue reading uh, verse 33 and on. It says, when uh, Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews, Eudaioi, who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. So, what's happening here? I want you to see the closeness that Eudaioi have to Mary and Martha and Lazarus. You don't show up to a stranger's funeral and cry and weep for them, unless you know that person personally, close, and well. Number one, you don't show up to, to a stranger's funeral anyway. So the fact that they showed up, they were already somehow closely associated. And the fact that they didn't just show up, they follow around these sisters, they want to help them out. And when they see them weeping, what they do? They're also weeping. And Yeshua sees them weeping for Lazarus, and he is moved by all the sadness and sorrow. I don't know about you, sometimes when I watch people cry, I kind of feel like crying too. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what's happening in this situation. When you see somebody weep, you feel sad. You share their sadness, you feel their pain. Mm -hmm. And so he is troubled. But I want you to see that it's not just the sisters weeping, the Udayoi, the Jews are weeping with them. Who, who previously had somewhat been characterized as being his enemy. Right. And it shows his compassion that even if that may have been the case, right. that a segment of that group right. were against him when he saw their their grief, he was deeply moved. That's right. Mm -hmm. So when he sees he, them crying, he wants to cry. He's he's not having the normal human reaction that you would like. I don't know if I can trust these people. Right. Some of them possibly. But they're in trouble and they're scared and hurt, and I feel for them. Right. So, very, very interesting situation. Yes. Now, that's something to keep in mind is that, you know, Jerusalem had a population, Jerusalem proper had a population of somewhere around 60, 80,000 people. Okay. And the surrounding area probably brought that up to, you know, 120 plus thousand people. So, you know, you don't sit there and get attacked by one person in the city and assume that everyone in the city hates you or anything like that. So, it, it, um, you know, while he considered, I think he would consider anyone representing the leadership there as potentially antagonistic. Um, these are best people that are coming out for someone who is either extremely poor himself or who is known for helping the poor. But his disciples had some sense that we right. might be in trouble. So the, the Jews are looking to kill you, yet right here he's with the Jews and they're crying and they're weeping for Lazarus. Are we talking about the same Jews? That's right. The That's the question That's the that we have to wrestle through. This is this is why we're having this experiment of trying to read it from the anti judean perspective, and it's not working because these Jews do not seem dangerous or bent on killing Yeshua. These are crying for Lazarus because they're sad that he died because they respected him and he loved him. He was a well loved man in the community, and so here he is. So they're weeping. He's troubled. Look, verse thirty four. And, and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. All right, so they show him actually to the tomb now. Now, verse 35, Jesus wept. So Yeshua can't take it. He breaks down, he's crying. Verse 36, so the Jews, Udayoi, were saying, see how he loved him? They're crying for him. They're crying for Lazarus. And Yeshua comes, and he can't take it, and he starts crying with them. And they're saying, he loves him. We love him. He loves him. Otherwise, we wouldn't be crying over the same guy together. And this is what's happening. I want you to see that there's this camaraderie that's happening and crying for Lazarus together, all of them. He's obviously said, see how he loved him. But some of them, verse 37 says, said, 
Could not this man who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man also from dying? So, you see, that's, that's, that's the downside. So somebody in the crowd says, look, he's crying for him. He, you know, the rabbi really obviously loved Lazarus. The other one says, well, couldn't, couldn't the guy who heals everybody else around also heal his best friend? You know, you would think he would, but he didn't. So they find some kind of fault in that as well. They, you will always have people who will be positive, and you'll have people who will have absolutely nothing positive to say about anything, no matter how positive or negative the situation is. And this is exactly what you're seeing at, at, over here. Is they're not happy with this, you know. They still can't get it. And it's maybe slightly off topic uh, uh, where you're going, but it's interesting why he's weeping. He's not weeping for that. He's not weeping because he doesn't think he's ever going to see him again. He came here planning to resurrect him. He's weeping because they are weeping. Because they're he's weeping. weeping. You got it. Their grief and pain. That's right. That's right. And you want to cry with them because of that empathy yep. and compassion. Because the connection you have. Maybe that's a good so, so this is so he doesn't cry until he sees the Udayoi cry, mm -hmm. is what I want you to see. Mm -hmm. That's when he starts crying. Now catch that. How about the fact that he's crying at all? Well, this is a very, very human emotion here. The guy who said I'm the resurrection and the life, right? Very human emotion. I, there's this, The beautiful part of the Gospels is that you will always see two parts of Yeshua. You'll always see both of them side by side and sometimes simultaneously. This is, this, is, this is beautiful. You're seeing a guy who says, I'm the resurrection of life, and then he sees people crying and he can't take it and he breaks down crying too. And so it, this is a crescendo. This is the moment. This is a very, very emotional passage. And I want you to feel the emotion, so I'm glad that uh, it, it's getting through. So, yet some people are not happy. Could this man not have healed his friend? Yeah, he could have. Obvious, the obvious answer is, but he didn't. So, uh, there's a reason why. So, a couple of things about Jewish burials that you need to understand. If you don't know this part of the culture, that makes this passage a little bit obscure. But let me help you kind of get this. So, Jewish burials during the Second Temple era in Israel had two stages. There was the first burial when the body was wrapped in a shroud and it was left to naturally decompose on a shelf in the tomb, in a cave, okay? Just kind of lay a person on a shelf. And then during the second burial, about a year later, give or take some time, the bones that remained uh, wrapped uh, in those burial clothes uh, were collected and placed into a box. A box is called an ossuary. You can see some ossuaries right here. It's a basically a limestone burial box which was then placed into a niche in the wall in the tomb. So if you're seeing this wall in the tomb, it has shelves where a person's body can be laid, and it has niche, uh, niche places where you can actually put that box in, on the shelf deeper in. And so a family tomb like this would have multiple boxes where actually multiple families could be buried. You didn't bury just one person per box, by the way, either. You actually could collect the entire family's bones and put them in one box. And the ossuary custom actually existed only for about 200, maybe maximum 250 years. And it fell into disuse after the destruction of Jerusalem. And obviously, as Jewish people are being displaced by the Romans, that no longer carried on. But in Judea, in that era, at that time, there was lots of caves. There were caves like this and uh, burial boxes uh, with bones would be placed. So when we're talking about Lazarus, you know, he is laying wrapped around on the shelf. And so the same way Yeshua would have been buried, wrapped around on the shelf, waiting for the time when all the soft tissue basically decays completely and the bones would be gathered and collected. Yes, sir. So, Peter, you're saying, <clears throat> I didn't realize that that was such a tight window for that. And I know this is a side point, but it's, I know quite a few people here have been to Israel, mm -hmm. and certainly Jerusalem, and we, the, some of the sites you still see the ossuary. Yeah. Like, uh, like I'm thinking of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Sure. You know, it's fairly common to see these, and you're saying those go all the way back to the Second Temple period. Yeah, yeah. In fact, one of the most yeah. fascinating finds that came to be in the 60s was an ossuary of, uh, that was very ornately carved. You could see it today in Israel Museum, and it had the words carved on it. And it said, Yosef bar Kaifa. And when they check the age and the date, the name matches, the time matches, and apparently Yosef bar Kaifa was buried in his ossuary 
with a silver coin between his teeth, as the Greeks did it, mm -hmm. because you have to pay the fare across river sticks if you want to get to the afterlife. Now, those of you who understand Greek mythology understand how they go into the afterlife. You say, what in the world would Caiaphas do with a coin between his teeth? Well, that tells you who Caiaphas placed his faith into when it comes to afterlife. Caiaphas the high priest. Caiaphas the high priest. That's right. That's the box. The box of Caiaphas the high priest is, is the one they found. A Jewish high priest mentioned in the Gospels is what he's referring to. Right. They found the actual ossuary that belonged to that man in Jerusalem. Uh, this accidentally doing a destruction project. Huh? Did they open it? Yes, they did. And they no. saw the gold? Plate. They exhumed they exhumed everything from the box and they actually carbon dated everything. They found out there were several people in the box, including a man who was probably like in his sixties, they say. Wow. There's also the bone box. It's controversial, but I, I, I also feel that it's legit. Uh, that he was found in Scripture that says Yahweh Ben uh, I think it's a Ben Yosef. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah they trying to be disproven, but nobody's been able to say definitively it is not the bone box. Okay. Yeah. They, that's that's another archaeological find that's been around, and people have been fighting over that one because yeah. they they don't they believe the first part of the inscription, but they say the second part of the inscription is a later edition, which could be could be not. We don't know. It it all it, the archaeologists are still duking that one out. Believe it or not, <laughs> they're still duking that one out. Yes. Can we, so, I mean, hypothetically, or should we? <laughs> yeah, would it be appropriate, would it be kosher for us to do something like that here? Or is it something that's just specific to Israel and to Jewish people? Well, it's, I mean, the, the, I, I don't know all of the halakhic ramifications, but the bottom line is it's not done. It's not done anymore. It's not done, done anymore. Huh? Could it? Yeah, I, I don't know. I can't give you a definition. I'm not familiar with the with the, with the Jewish legal issues around to, to be able to give you a clear answer. But being that it's you know, this was I want you to understand this was a peculiar custom. This was a custom. This was not something that people said, the Torah says, therefore we must do. Right. This is a custom that developed over time. This is how people began burying their dead for whatever reason. And that custom existed until the flow of the custom was interrupted by tragedy, okay? So it might have actually gone on for a longer time and then at some point dissipated. But I'm telling you that it was simply a custom that people followed. And so by knowing history, by knowing archeology, span we could say, this is how they did it back then. So for example, when Yeshua says to a man, come and follow me, and he says, wait, I need to bury my father. Mm -hmm. What is he talking about? Well, I would say he's talking about the second burial. Right. Not it looks like like wait a minute my father's about to die, <laughs> you know. Then when he's finally done, then I'll, then I'll go follow you. No, what he's saying is my father's already dead, but I need to stay and wait so that I can transfer his bones into the box, and then I'm free. Then my obligations are 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 open, and I can follow you. And no, he says no. He says I want you to come now. Let the no, dead bury their dead. Right? That's a, remember that. It's a very harsh statement, right? Very insensitive statement. Sounds sounds like something very insensitive Yeshua would say, yes. right? I mean, we, I mean, come on, it's in the Torah. Honor your father and your mother, right? And it sounds like what he's going is against that, but it's not. If you understand first century burial customs, yeah, it is significant to note that there is a common, I would say, a very very general rough parallel in that you bury today. You bury your dead. You bury your dead, but then also approximately a little approximately a year later, you have an unveiling of the tombstone. Right. We have so the same custom today. It's a, again, we're talking about a custom mm -hmm. um, that, that would be done according to you know strict Jew, you know Jewish. Yeah, it's another like, Jewish custom. We did not unveil my, when my mom passed away. She was buried in an Orthodox synagogue in Baltimore, and then a year later, we had the unveiling of the tombstone, which is a you know. I don't know enough about this issue to know if there's a direct line as far as it goes, but it is a, at the very least, a parallel that, yeah. of the two-stage kind of idea. Right. Customs are like that. They can be very enduring, and they can go on for a long time, and they can and be re revolve again and again. You know, there's different sort of say, but there's the feeling, the idea of mourning and the prolonged, and there's something about the year anniversary. That's always been a part of Jewish psyche, as far, like even when we say the Kaddish, 
You know, why do you sit in the cottage for a year, right? Why, why a year? Why? Because that's, this is the time when this transition will happen. This is the time when you finally put the person to rest and you say, okay, now this is truly final and I'm going to move on. But I've given this a year. I have, I've taken a year to, to focus on missing this person, you know, to this degree because I'm going to acknowledge him on a regular basis through saying to the Kaddish and things like that through. And so this kind of landmark, it's a landmark essentially in a person's life, like a lot of landmarks that we have in our, in our ritual life, sort of say. So it's an interesting custom. Now, how understanding this helps us a little bit, right? Helps us to kind of enter into that world. So this is what they're experiencing. That's what they're expecting. And that's what's going on. So the, his body is laying in the tomb, naturally decomposing. There's no embalming. There's no preservation of any sorts. Okay. It, he's laying in the tomb, and by now it's been four days. Okay, so that's that's what's important. Now, uh, John eleven thirty eight, um, verse thirty eight. So Jesus again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and the stone was laid against it. Jesus said, "Remove the stone." Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, "Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days." Now he's, we already heard the four days. Now the four days is mentioned again. Whenever something is mentioned multiple times, you start wondering, why is this important? Why is it so such a big deal about four days? Now, Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. All right, no embalming, no preservation. He stinks after four days. Remove the stone. This is serious business. Now, why did Yeshua delay before going to Mary and Martha? Remember, there was this intentional delay. He said, I'm going to stay back a couple of days, then I'm going to start my journey. Now, according to Jewish tradition, the spirit of the deceased lingers for three days near the body. This is tradition. You're not going to find this in the Bible. Okay? Just tradition. But such is the Lord. After three days, the dead body decays, and its appearance changes, and then the spirit notices that the appearance is visibly changed. There's no chance of going back, essentially. And that's when the spirit leaves. Such is the tradition. So Yeshua waited to be sure to come to Bethany on the fourth day after Lazarus' burial, when in people's minds the body is so deformed that the resurrection is no longer possible. See, there's a chance in the three-day window. But he waited up until the fourth day so that nobody could say oh sure enough he raised them within the window of the possibility right. he waits when it's no longer possible in people's minds to do this through after th three days are done so so he deliberately does that and john deliberately mentions the delay it's kind of like i don't know if it's elijah or elisha um when uh widow's son dies and he sends his servant on ahead with his staff to lay it across the kid's body and you know it, it, the idea be there, so he's signaling to the kid's spirit, you know, wait, I'm coming, <laughs> stay put, <Right. laughs> make this easy on me. And then he comes rushing in to revive the kid as soon as possible, right. because the longer, the, the more of a chance to sort of move on, right. and, that, and that goes beyond that. Yeshua was deliberately waiting till Lazarus is clearly on the other side. Clearly on the other side, exactly. That's the idea. So, so this is the Lord. This is the tradition I want you to know, Kamp. Uh, that I looked for this tradition because I'm the kind of guy that I'm always interested to find where's the stuff coming from. So, and I did found it. Uh, found it in Yevamot in uh, Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. Now, you're not going to find this in Babylonian Talmud, by the way. It's only in Yerushalmi, not not a not a parallel in Babylonian. So, this is a commentary on the traditional uh, saying, and the commentary says Rav Beri and and Rav Papi Rav Yoshua of Sachin in the name of Rav Leva says, for the first three days after death, the soul floats above the body, thinking that it will return to the body. When the soul sees the body, that the appearance of the face has changed, it leaves the body and goes its way. So this is, this is where this tradition is coming from, or at least this is where it's preserved. How far back it goes, I have no idea. This is the earliest reference in writing that I find to this tradition. But I do know by reading from the book of John, that this is what everybody else was thinking. Mm -hmm. They're thinking, okay, this is, he's already outside of the windows of the possibility, yet this is what's gonna happen. Wow, you're still watching. Now, if you've not subscribed to my channel by now, you really must hit that button. 
Uh, just a quick forecast for you. In this particular segment, I finished reading the story with you uh, from John 11 and see uh, once again how this experiment of reading the Jews as a collective reference to the Jewish people in mass simply does not work. It's time to reread the gospel. So, we keep reading. Uh, John 11, verse 41. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you would always hear me, but because of the people standing around and I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Pretty dramatic story, right? But he, this is this is the unraveling of it all. In the end, he performs this resurrection, and despite of the fact that the guy is already decayed, four days, no hope of resurrection. Yet he says, "You know what? Come out!" And he comes out. So this is a very powerful story. Very, very powerful story. Now, what's always interesting whenever a story like this happens is what is the fallout? What is the reaction? And this is the part that I really want you to pay attention to, besides the fact that the man was just raised outside of the window of the possibilities. Um, verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews, the Udayoi, who had come to Mary and saw what he had done, believed in him. Many. Okay? Greek says it. English repeats it. They believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Now, if the Jews means Jewish people ethnically, then who are the ones who went to the Pharisees? Were the Pharisees not Jews? Wouldn't it say some of the Jews believed and other Jews went to other Jews, right? That's essentially what it says because we know the Pharisees are Jews too. Do you see how we have slippery butter going on over here? You know, wet water going on? <laughs> we have a lot of repetition, unnecessary words, if they shouldn't be there. So unless the word Udayoi is not to be meant as ethnic Jews, but simply is a reference to some particular group of people, or a subgroup of people, that John knows about, and everybody else in the audience knows about, that we are oblivious to, okay? So, but it's interesting that many of them believed some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what they saw. Now, why did they go to the Pharisees? Because the guy just rose from the dead. If anybody needs a good case law to argue about the resurrection of the dead, now the Pharisees got a witness. In fact, they got a bunch of witnesses. In fact, they just have a guy who was dead four days. So if the Pharisees ever need to prove their point for once and for all, they now have an awesome case <laughs> to prove their point. That's why they went to the Pharisees. You won't believe this guy what he did. You know, you should really talk to this guy because if he does this on a regular basis, we can put this whole issue to bed. <laughs> I mean, Thus are our opponents' arguments that's right. refuted. My that's friend. right. That's it. Please, can, can you please do this thing you do? <laughs> okay, demonstration. You, you get the point. You get the point. This is That's why they go to the Pharisees. When when you read this, the way it's translated, it almost makes it, it, it reads like this. <coughs> that you had those that saw it happen and they believed. Right. But then all those that didn't believe, they went and told the Pharisees. Like, that's right. Sure that's well, they believed what he did, <coughs> but but th 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 that's not the point. I know, but the point is that they the all trans believed. The translation <laughs> saying about makes putting a lot the word sense. but. So right. Um, that word but just kind of. Yes, that, that makes it look like an antipathy, right? So, like, like one's in opposition to the other, but it's really right. more of a. It may ought to be translated moreover or furthermore. You got it. The Greek, you got it. Yeah, I was about to say, is the Greek chi or de? I don't remember, but either uh, chi would obviously be a conjunction like end, but even de is used in a conjunctive form in many places. So. Day is one of those conjunctions that can go in an oppositional direction or in a complementary direction. So either one of them would actually be fine. So yeah, well, that second, probably shouldn't be there. Second question, uh, when it says some of them, some of all the Jews were there or some of the ones who believed? It's, is it as ambiguous in the Greek as yeah, it is? it's ambiguous. It says many, yeah, yeah. many. So that, so, but but I'll, here's what I want you to see. People actually have no problem believing them. And, and they do. And, and some go into Pharisees and report. 
Now, verse 47, therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convene a council. So now that they know what happened, it's been reported to them, they convene a council. And we're saying, what are we, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So who are these people that are talking here now? Obviously, these are the powerful elites. They look at the nation as theirs. They look at the jobs and positions as theirs. It's mine. It's owed to me. This is my right to rule. And these people, you know, this guy that does all these miracles, he's going to get us in trouble with the Romans. They're going to come and take it away from us. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, they're not dynamic Maybe, here. though, they're not. We shouldn't have scribed <coughs> such motivation. They felt it was their responsibility to take of care of the nation. Of course. So they could be honestly trying to figure out, is this a good thing for us or not a good thing for us? Yeah. The guy raising the dead and performing miracles, from their perspective, yes. is dangerous. But why is it dangerous? Because the Romans are going to come, and the Romans are going to crack down on it. What do the Romans care about the guy raising the dead? Romans don't care about the guy raising the dead. You know what the Romans care about? Revolution. Because if you, got, if you have a guy raising the dead, he can lead a revolution. In fact, he can lead a perfect army that cannot be extinguished. Because the moment you kill him, I just raise him from the dead, right? So that's, that's, that's the scary part, right? You can, it, we're, getting, we're getting into sci-fi now, right? <laughs> but well, that's why, but you know, remember, they've been through multiple <clears throat> false messianic right. claimants on this. And so, you know, it, regardless of whether they believe the sign happened or not, the big thing is that they know everyone's calling this guy the messiah. Right. Now they're getting rumors from multiple witnesses that he's raising the dead. Yep. Whether or not they believe he's actually physically done that or not, they can see this popularity is growing, and it's like, this guy's going to get us into a war just by existing. Exactly. You know, if, if people start proclaiming he's the Messiah, the Romans are going to catch wind of it. Even if he doesn't intend to raise an army to go fight the Romans, the Romans are going to hear about you know the, the Messiah, and they're going to come against us because they're going to take us to hold. If enough people, if there's that critical mass, they're going to say the whole nation's rebellion. They're going to you know destroy the nation and the temple. Yes. So they're they're that's what they're afraid of. Yeah. That's exactly what they're afraid of. So this that's the implication. So that's what I wanted you to see. Uh, verse fifty three. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. So who just planned? The chief priests and Pharisees. All right. Um, therefore, Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, the Udaioi, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. So it makes it sound like Jesus moved to another country, hmm. but he didn't. Because I, I brought a map just on purpose. Here's Jerusalem right here. Okay, you want to know where Ephraim is? Right there. Okay, same distance as Jericho. Same distance as Jericho. We're not talking about him really moving out of country. He didn't go overseas, although it makes it sound like it. Hmm. So he went, he didn't want to walk among the Jews, so he went to another Jewish town to walk around other Jews. <laughs> see, see the irony of the statement? Because guess what? Ephraim is not a foreign town. It's still a Jewish town. It's still, it's actually in the borderline of Samaria and Judea. That's really where where Judea kind of ends and Samaria begins. Because right, right here is, is this invisible border. It's right, we'll be right there. So he's still, he's still in Israel. Do you see how crazy, you know, kind of how you can, you can read this this way. We're experimenting by reading in an anti way. So the town of Ephraim that he went to, which is really not that far, is really on the outskirts of Judea. So just outside perhaps of the jurisdiction of the Udayoi. Let's put it that way. So he just kind of fled across the county lines, if you want to think about it this way. The police are chasing me, so what do I do? All I have to do is cross the border, and I'm no longer their problem, right? So think of it this way, perhaps. I'm just playing around with our, with our local you know, jurisdiction and things like that, but imagine something like that. So he goes, what I want you to see is that Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, because it makes it sound like he, he's like, all right, I'm done with Jews. I'm going to walk publicly among some other people now. And he goes to another Jewish town called Ephraim. <laughs> you can read it this way, but when you know geography, you can't. All of a sudden, it falls apart. So that's, that's kind of where we are. So 
have you had fun doing a little experiment of trying to read the passage from different perspectives? It's fun sometimes to play a role and saying, all right, I'm gonna take your point of view and I'm gonna to try to read it like you would read it. And in the end, knowing what you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't work anymore. So who are, who are the Jews in John's Gospel? Several different possibilities are presented for you. We could say that it's either one of those people, depending on the context, depending on the passage, or sometimes it could be a combination of all of those things altogether. What's very clear is that John's audience is very clear who they are. We may not be clear living thousands of years from now, not in that area, not part of that whole sort of say dynamic, but they know very well who the Udayoi are and whom he means by Udayoi. And so we keep guessing, but you know, they, they're quite clear on that. And so when you're not clear of who the fight is with, when you're not clear what even the fight or the conflict is about, it's very easy to misread it. And this is how we get to anti-Judaism in John's gospel. We have people basically, sometimes innocently, sometimes unknowingly, sometimes simply out of ignorance misreading the story and reading it that way. Why? Because they live in a world where there's Jews and Christians and there's an antipathy between these two communities. And so if Jesus is a Christian, then the Jews are bad because they're anti-Jesus. And so that's, that's how that rhetoric gets built. It can be done, but that's not a natural reading of the gospel.